Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is George A. Selgin, director of the Cato Institute Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. Welcome back to Free Thoughts, George. Thanks, Trevor. So today we're going to be discussing, uh, at least in part, the gold standard, which is something that is actually associated with libertarians quite a bit, uh, gold bugs, a lot of kind of discussion of things like this. Uh, before we get into some of those kind of issues about libertarians and the gold standard, what is the gold standard when people just say, we need a gold standard? What do they mean? Well, I can't tell you what other people mean because that depends. But at its most basic, a gold standard is a monetary system where the basic money unit is a definite quantity of, of gold. So it could be uh, an ounce or two or three or any other weight of gold of a certain purity. And of course, that the uh, a gold standard system would have actual coins representing those that, that basic quantity or multiples or fractions thereof, and that's it's, that's the most basic gold standard. But of course, uh, we have to think about paper money and how that fits in. And uh, uh, there, traditionally, uh, paper money fits into a gold standard uh, by consisting only of of uh, good claims or IOUs to gold where, where the IOUs are promises to pay definite quantities of gold which are again based on whatever those standard units are and uh, their coin representatives. So that's at its most basic. And this is a big distinction between coins which used to – a lot of people don't even realize were about – they actually had – the gold, like gold or silver or bronze in them and they were actually valuable, correct? As, as yes, opposed of to course. Bills. They were valuable because uh, gold is a valuable commodity and its value might be enhanced by the fact that it's also the monetary metal. But uh, its value doesn't depend on that fact. It, it exists independently. Uh, but, uh, but it's always important to recognize that as soon as you have paper money, in a gold standard, you've got more than one condition for the gold standard being in effect. You have the condition for what coins consist of or the most basic ones. And then, of course, you have the requirements for paper money itself. I want to add one more dimension of this because uh, not to complicate it too much, but uh, the nature of the uh, paper gold standard, to call it that, uh, it has changed uh, a lot in history uh, and the most fundamental change has to do with the extent to which governments are involved in administering paper money. As I said, in the very old, uh, earliest stages, uh, paper money that was consistent with the gold standard uh, consisted of uh, real IOUs to gold that were enforceable IOUs because they were based on enforceable private contracts. Basically, if a bank issued paper notes, for example, uh, and uh, it dishonored them by not giving people the gold that they promised to pay, then that bank was in default and that was that. But <clears throat> as, uh, reg as uh, central banks or government-sponsored banks more generally and governments themselves became involved in issuing paper money, when that happened, uh, the nature of these paper representatives to gold changed even before they obviously – it obviously changed by the gold – by the governments reneging on their commitments. It changed in a more subtle way before that because a sovereign immunity attached to governments and to the central banks that they sponsored or eventually it did attach to the latter. And as that happened, uh, it was no longer the case that a central bank that dishonored its promises to pay gold would necessarily suffer any consequences. It became more like the government itself in that regard. And as soon as that happened, the nature of the gold standard itself changed because it was, ceased to be all that reliable, at least so far as its paper uh, representatives were concerned. And that was, of course, the slippery slope to fiat money, uh, which is what you end up with when these uh, central banks take advantage of their sovereign immunity to say, well, we're just not going to pay you anymore. Why gold? I mean, when we talk about a gold standard, either in the past or you know, we, the arguments that we should return to one today. Are we talking literally about gold? Should we be talking about gold? Does it really matter if it's gold or any other commodity? That depends, of course, on, on who you ask. It's true that there's a, uh, 
There's uh, the gold standard is of commodity standards, the one that's most well known and most popular, particularly among libertarians, as Trevor was saying. Uh, but a lot of this is just historical accident. It should be observed that uh, although the gold standard has ancient roots, uh, so does the silver standard. Silver is the most uh, clear, obvious uh, uh, competitor to gold and among commodity monies. Both of those metals have obviously adva obvious advantages over other commodities in not being so perishable and, and so on. Uh, but um, in, in U.S. history, for example, the, the gold standard as such was not officially adopted until 1900. Up to that time, we were officially, if not in practice, on a uh, bimetallic standard where the, the dollar, where the basic monetary unit of the United States was uh, defined both as a definite quantity of gold and as a definite quantity of silver. That's what bimetallism uh, means. Now, in practice, what happened under that arrangement, both in the United States and in other countries, in many other countries that had it, uh, is, was that um, depending on which of the two precious metals was more valuable in the open marketplace and how their relatives value, relative values there compared to their implied official values given the two, def, the two units that define the same dollar, uh, the two amounts of metal that define the same dollar, you would have a tendency for one or the other metal to be driven out of circulation, for, to disappear from circulation, and for only the uh, 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 for the remaining metal to be their true standard in effect at that time. And so, uh, for quite a while in. Uh, in U.S. history, we were actually on a, a de facto, if not a de jure, a silver standard. And then uh, partly as a result of gold discoveries, mainly as a result of gold discoveries that made it the relatively undervalued, legally undervalued, sorry, overvalued metal, uh, gold uh, became the de facto standard, though still not the only official standard money. And as I said, it was only in 1900 that gold was officially enshrined as the soul's standard metal. And finally, we should remember that there were, were important long periods, including from the Civil War until 1879, when we were neither on a gold nor a silver standard, uh, but on a temporary paper standard, the greenbacks in this case. What, what sort of problem for those who talk about the gold standard incessantly, I'm just going to say, because there's a lot of people there and I were talking about this before we record that there's just people who talk about the gold standard a lot um, and they're kind of quirky about how they talk about it. They, they can take any conversation and direct it back to the gold standard uh, as the solution to everything on the planet. Uh, yeah. But what, so for those people, and we'll talk, I, we'll talk, I want to talk a little bit more about those people, but. I call them. Find another bar stool. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'm sure you get berated particularly, but what sort of problem do is it supposed to solve? Uh, it seems like you just talked about problems that were created by the gold standard, especially when you found new caches of gold. Was that seems to be a problem? Well, uh, let's be careful now. What I said was that uh, under bimetallism. Uh, discoveries of precious metals of one or the other kind could could uh, disrupt the standard and cause you to switch from effectively being on one standard to being on another. But I would call that a problem of bimetallism, not of uh, having a metallic standard per se. Uh, as for the benefits of having a gold standard, to a considerable extent, they are the same as those of having a silver standard or any other stable single commodity standard, uh, though some are better than others in this respect. And that big advantage consists of the fact that commodities, all of them, are naturally scarce, most obviously those that are not reproducible like gold. So they, uh, a standard based on such a commodity obviously doesn't does, doesn't allow limitless uh, money creation uh, or inflation, puts a constraint on it. But in fact, the advantage is better than that to take the case of the gold standard um, uh, uh, and of bimetallism for that matter. We can see from the historical record that it had a tendency to, 
a very good tendency to preserve long-run price level stability. For example, if you go back to the very earliest price level data that we have for the United States and allowing that, you know, those numbers, those figures are not all that reliable, still, they suggest that back at the early days of the Republic, we're talking about the 1790s, the, the price level was approximately what it was still in 1913. Now, it changed, it bounced around a lot between those two dates, again, according to the statistics we have. But the long run tendency for it to come back to wherever it started was uh, very, is very clear in the data. So it's you're saying essentially no, but it, with, with, with fluctuations, but essentially no inflation. No between, long run inflation. Between 1790 and 1930. That's right. And that's not a coincidence. It's, it's, an, it's a feature of uh, a commodity standard like a gold standard, and it's not hard to explain. Uh, essentially, uh, here's what happens. Suppose, uh, remember that in a gold standard, the price of a unit of gold is the one thing that doesn't change, right? So if you define a dollar as so many ounces of gold, obviously the price of that many ounces of gold stays one dollar. Uh, so what does it mean to talk about inflation in a case like that? It means that other prices are rising relative to the price of gold. Well, what does that mean? It means that the costs of implements and materials and labor for producing gold those costs are going up, but the price of gold isn't going up, which means the profitability of mining gold is going down. And that means that inflation tends to be self-limiting because the more it progresses, the less profitable it is to mine or search for gold. And so gold output eventually slows down. Mines can even be closed because they cease to be profitable. And uh, that puts a break on the money supply. And eventually, the price level will stop growing and will even come back down. On the other hand, if you have a period of deflation, that makes gold mining and prospecting more worthwhile. And uh, the tendency is for such uh, efforts to result in a greater output of gold that reverses the downward movement in prices. And this is exactly what happened historically. You had uh, uh, discoveries of gold like the discovery in California, which is a famous one, that are not really accidental when you look at the big picture. What happens in most cases is prices have been falling. People start prospecting harder for gold and eventually they find it. Sometimes they find a lot of it. But instead of causing inflation, the main effect of these discoveries, more often than not, not always, is to reverse what had been a deflationary trend and so help prices come back where they were before. So this long run uh, stability of the price level is, is in fact a built in feature of many commodity standards. And, uh, and that long run stability will uh, hold as long as the basic uh, cost of production of gold uh, at the, it has to be rising at the margin, but on the long run, the, uh, the cost of producing gold just has to not fall any faster than that of most other goods. Does picking the commodity matter in the sense that so gold has other uses? You know, so we we can use it in electronics, and it can be very good in certain things. And so, does it? Do we run the risk of if we have a gold standard of directing what might be a valuable resource to a less efficient use because people want to use it for as money, and it's less valuable then to use it in these ways that could be, you know, better in the future or more wealth creating. Well, if you want to have the advantage I just described of a commodity standard, uh, you, you, it's difficult to have uh, except by having a commodity <laughs> and the commodity is by definition something that's got a value other than its value as, as money. So any commodity standard is going to involve opportunity costs from employing the commodity as money rather than in other ways. Those costs can be uh, kept at a minimum, however, by taking careful advantage of substitutes, including paper substitutes of the sort I referred to before. And if you have a, a, a well-conceived and regulated uh, system of paper substitutes and also bank deposit substitutes that don't have to be actual paper, 
that system can allow you to have a, a commodity standard, a gold standard, for example, where the actual amount of gold employed to maintain the standard is very low. Just to give you an extreme case, in the Scottish banking system that you fellows know I'm very fond of because it was a very free banking system, uh, the banks got by at one point with the reserve ratios, that is precious metal reserves of something like 1 to 2 percent of their total assets. Most of the money that was actually used in Scotland consisted of the redeemable notes of a set of Scottish banks and also deposits held at those same banks. And uh, for most of Scotland's uh, history in the late 19th and 18th and early 19th century, the system besides being cheap was also remarkably stable. Adam Smith writes eloquently about its properties in both respects in Book 2, Chapter 2 of The Wealth of Nations. And what he points out is precisely, uh, Aaron, the point that by saving on actual gold, it uh, allowed uh, first that gold to be put to other uses and second, people's savings to be harnessed for uh, productive, more productive uses by being backed by bank productive bank loans. So in this situation, just to make sure I understand, um, the pound notes or whatever they were issuing uh, were worth a very little amount of gold. No, no. You're saying, you're they saying, were they weren't worth a little gold. But they were redeemable they were, for a very were, little they amount were of backed, gold. No, not even that. They were backed. So uh, to, let's take that one percent number, right? So you might have a Scottish fine five pound Scottish. Royal Bank of Scotland note. What what I'm saying is that if you went to the Royal Bank of Scotland, its total gold reserves might be one to two percent of the value of its total outstanding liabilities, including all its notes. Ah, so it was. But so that didn't mean that the note that the note that you were holding was worth anything less than five pounds, or that the bank would give you anything less than five pounds worth of gold if you if you sought to redeem that that note. In fact, of course, uh, 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 the bank notes did circulate at their full face value just about all the time and the banks did redeem them and those things go hand in hand. If a bank didn't redeem, <laughs> the notes would no longer command their face value. So in other words, the banks found uh, ways to manage their affairs such that they were able to get by with slim reserves. Uh, but of course, to get there, they had to show their capacity to honor their promises regularly and, and it took a long time for them to establish their reliability. But they did so to the point where the, your average Scotchman, the last thing he wanted was to have to hold a gold guinea thought it was a, a nuisance and would rush to his bank and get quick uh, good Scottish banknote to take its place. But, but that's how it was. they couldn't survive. That means that if there was a run to go get your gold, they would they would run out. Well, they might have to do some quick, some quick <laughs> thinking. moving around. Yeah, but, yeah, it's but it weird. runs. Runs were almost unknown, almost completely unknown. Uh, runs happen in in decadent banking systems like ours today, uh, and in the past, they are uh, they are a symptom of a banking system that has uh, de not developed in a healthy fashion. And and that's that gets us into the, the sort of the next question, which which. Uh, both is going back to the quirky gold standard person, uh, which is something. Because Aaron and I, as we, as I mentioned, um, we don't know a lot about monetary policy compared to other things that we know about. Uh, but it's always very interesting to me. But one reason, and I can be honestly say, if someone comes up to me and the first thing they start talking about is the gold standard. And that's the, this actually happened literally last night at a Cato uh, reception. A guy came up and, and said, "Are you from, are you a fan of of sound money?" And and I pretty much assumed that the guy is going to be really quirky, if a kind of conspiracy theorist in other ways. And sure enough, he immediately got into the Rothschilds, the Illuminati, and all these things. And and. Any and also, you know, any if you're your podcast about, listeners cannot see me cringing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and if you're talking about his hands over his face, <laughs> if you're having a conversation about I don't know police brutality, they'll be like, "Well, we can't do anything unless we restore sound money." And I, and and they could. So here's the question: Why do why do you think these people are are so focused on gold? What is it? What is it about gold and just sound money in general? 
that makes there's it a several onto things it. going on here, and I I, th I feel there's a, there's a risk, of course, of of lumping all people who are fond of the gold standard together with with uh, of the, the nutcases, and I certainly don't want to do that. Some of my best friends are. Uh, are, are fond of the gold standard, including some very good economists I know. However, uh, it must be said that a big part of the specific appeal of gold, as opposed to other precious, um, other commodity standards, certainly, has to do with the fact that it was the last uh, commodity standard in place here in the United States. And uh, there's a sense that uh, that's the most obvious choice to go back to if we could ever have a commodity standard again. There's also a lingering feeling, I think, among some that after all, people got swindled when uh, uh, they suspended gold payments back in the 30s and ultimately uh, abrogated all of the uh, government's commitments uh, based on gold bonds and other things. And, and it's confiscated pub private gold holdings to boot, that, that all of this was quite a nasty thing and, and that uh, we, may, we need in some way to make up for it. The problem with that, of course, is that every year that goes by, uh, it becomes a less uh, compelling <laughs> point of view. It's already been, uh, you know, some nine, on almost 90 years, or 80, you know, 80 plus years since this happened. And, uh, and uh, you know, it gets to the point where it's almost uh, akin to suggesting that we really ought to give uh, all the property back to the American – Native Americans, which, you know, there's, there's certainly an argument from justice that that – <laughs> that they deserve it. And, uh, but it'd be, a little, hand, it'd be a little disruptive. It'd be a little bit disruptive. And let's face it, the, the Native Americans who live today, the, the, the connections that they can show to any existing property are perhaps not all that obvious. In the case of gold, though, it's even more uh, clear that uh, justice wouldn't be served by trying to restore the old gold standard. Uh, because, among other things, it would require a massive deflation to get there, and that itself would be an awfully painful uh, procedure. You could try to restore a new gold standard, of course, where the dollar represents a much each dollar represents a much smaller part of gold. But what would that have to do with restoring justice or making up for anything that happened in the past? The argument for doing anything like that for any renewal of the gold standard, in my opinion has to be based on its advantages starting today and not on any claim that it would redress uh, past injustices. So as soon as you put it that way, then you also, I think, are compelled to, to say that we might also have to consider, we should consider all other alternatives for reforming the present system instead of treating gold as being in, in any way sacrosanct. Bygones are bygones. If gold is a good choice today and if there's a good way to implement it now, well, by gosh, let's fight for it. But if, uh, if there are other better alternatives we can think of today, the fact that gold was once our monetary – our standard monetary uh, metal uh, is itself no reason to, f to argue for restoring it to that role. Are there any countries today that are still on a gold standard? No. Well, is that – did that happen? I mean, I, I, again, I'm picturing quirky gold standard guy in my brain, but uh, did, did they kind of all slowly move off of it uh, because they were constrained and wanted to inflate their currencies, uh, or they could, or would it be impossible for a gold standard country to exist in a world where everyone else has doesn't have a gold standard? Well, I think to to a, to a considerable extent, the last statement is true, but but what actually happened was that most of the countries that were on the gold standard. Uh, went off in the course of the the Great Depression. Now it should be said that, uh, in fact, uh, m m those countries, most of them, originally went off the gold standard during World War One, and then between World War One and the Great Depression, to the extent that they got back on a gold standard, they did so often in a kind of jury rigged sort of way, so that this uh, this gold standard that was uh, 
reestablished, these gold standards reestablished after World War I, where uh, Rube Goldberg contraptions compared to the stand, gold standards in effect before World War I, and they were very fragile. In any event, uh, the Depression caused it all, them all to uh, to break apart one after the other. And in fact, uh, although the United States left the gold standard itself in 1933, uh, it did so only partially. It uh, never allowed its citizens to again convert paper money into gold. However, it did resume gold payments for foreign central banks. And it continued to do so in its capacity as the supplier of reserve currency under the so-called Bretton Woods system. So the U.S. In, in a, remained to a limited degree uh, on the gold standard until uh, it was finally taken off completely uh, in the early years of the Nixon administration. So, uh, uh, so in fact, we remained, we were the last gold standard country, though we were so only uh, in a, uh, uh, ex to an extent that was much more limited than had been the case before the Great Depression. Now, a lot of people would describe the going off of the gold standard, as I, as I mentioned, that that it was, it, it was governments. I mean, conspiring with the Bretton Woods attacks on Bretton Woods, but governments conspiring to break the boundaries, the break the confines that gold put on their ability to inflate the currency in order to do more spending and more pernicious things. Is this accurate, would you say, to some extent? Well, uh, there's no need for the word conspiracy. Well, just getting because, together and planning, uh, I guess, is a the conspiracy. The fact is that, um, that um, uh, in the case of Bretton Woods, uh, what happened was uh, the U.S. had found itself, uh, its dollars being treated as the official reserve currency of other countries. So the gold standard for all those other countries survived only in the sense that their currencies were convertible into dollars, which were ultimately convertible into gold. Uh, not, but not by U.S. citizens, but by foreign central uh, banks and foreign authorities. Uh, so um, what happened though was uh, what, what you might expect to happen in a situation like that, uh, being, uh, being in the position of supplying the world's reserve currency means that a central bank can issue more of its liabilities, can expand, and doesn't face any immediate necessary request for redemption because its IOUs are themselves being treated as reserves. Gold may be the ultimate reserves, but, uh, reserve, but, but uh, uh, for a while at least, other central banks would be happy to sit on the uh, official reserves and not, on, not turn them into ultimate reserves of gold. Well, though, as prices rose in the 60s because the Fed was issuing more money in part owing to fiscal pressures from uh, the Vietnam War first and the Great Society afterwards or along with it, the, the, uh, the French in particular started to cash in their gold chips. And this is what broke down Bretton, Bretton Woods because uh, – our IOUs, the Fed's IOUs, the promises had expanded, but its gold reserves were limited. And ultimately, to to uh, prevent, to avoid running out of gold, uh, they they suspended payments, much as they'd done in the 30s, but this time for foreign governments as well. And that was that. So um, now the real the real problem here isn't conspiracy. It really boils down to the different status of a central bank compared to a private bank, as I mentioned before. A private bank simply couldn't say, well, we're not going to pay you anymore or even we're going to devalue. Even today, you go to your bank of deposit, forget about deposit insurance, that's not the point, but suppose you go to your bank and you say, I'd like to, to cash, uh, I have a $1,000 deposit balance and I'd like to have my money back. Now, what that means today is that that bank owes you $1,000 worth of Federal Reserve currency. But suppose it said to you, oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, we've had a devaluation. So your $1,000 of deposit credits are now only worth $500 in Federal Reserve notes. Well, no, they can't do that. That's called default. That's failure. 
they close. There's, there's no two ways around it. And this is how it's always been for ordinary commercial banks. They simply don't have the right to decide to pay less because their liabilities are true, genuine liabilities, promises to pay. They're, they're solemn promises. The courts insisted they be honored. OK. Or there are consequences. But, but a central bank, it, it took time for people to realize this because there was a, a long period when Central banks were not really sovereign entities. They were private and, and they acted like private firms. But eventually, they, as they got more and more, um, let's say, cozy with governments, they acquired the character, sovereign uh, immunities of governments themselves. And at that point, they could say, as the Fed said in, in, in 1970, um, sorry, we're not going to pay. And nothing happens. The bank doesn't get wind down wound down. It doesn't get closed. The shareholders take no losses. There's no inquiries. There's no liquidation. There's no receivership. None of that happens. And of course, what that means is the temptation for uh, central banks to accommodate governments when the governments lean on them uh, is great because the repercussions for the central bankers are, are minimal <laughs> and this makes a huge difference. And that's what happened in the case of the Fed uh, in, the, in the 70s and many other central banks before and since that although they start out with a commitment to a fixed exchange rate, whether metallic or, or, or otherwise, it could be some foreign currency fixed exchange rate, uh, there's not much holding that thing together because there's not many penalties borne by a central bank that dishonors uh, these commitments. And this, by the way, uh, to segue, is one reason why restoring a gold standard today would be very, very difficult. So that brings up the question too of the relationship between the Fed and a gold standard. And maybe we, we sort of need to explain exactly what the Fed does. But they're often talked about together and you say, OK, well, we, we, have, we used to have the gold standard and now we have the Fed. But we had a the Fed and a gold standard at some point. Um, and that's possible, maybe not desirable, but it's at least possible. Absolutely. Uh, central banks can coexist with uh, metallic standards, but they don't tend to do so for very long for the reason I just explained. The fact that there are no serious repercussions for central banks, at least once they obtain the the uh, status of, of sovereign entities or treated by the courts as such. At that point, the jig is pretty much up. It's just a matter of time before the, the promise ceases to be worth anything. So, which is the which is the first problem? If you were, if you were to central start, banking is the start, first problem. You start, you, you, if you had to, to which one do you need to what domino do you need to fall first to start getting in order to fix it, our monetary, fix system. Oh. monetary system? Well, yeah. um, okay. So let's just step back a bit. Uh, the, 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 you can have a gold standard without a central bank and you can have a competitive banking system like the Scottish system where the banks are all commercial banks. They issue the paper money but that's a commercial promise just like your modern bank deposit and that will hold together. That will be – that will tend to endure. There will be bank failures uh, uh, and so on. But there's, there won't be or there will be? There will be. Yeah. Of course, some well, banks will fail. Well, that's just competitive fail. failure, right? But, but uh, there's no tendency for the whole system to give up on the gold standard at the same time. Uh, there may be crises, of course. Uh, but uh, the nature of the underlying contracts is such that it's actually rather difficult to not have the thing – uh, uh, stay together because you'd have to rewrite contracts, and unless you're talking about sovereign entity entities, that's not so easy to do. Uh, as soon as you monopolize currency issuing privileges in a in a privileged institution, uh, whether you call it a central bank or not, you're already on this slippery slope where the the uh, longevity, the survivability of the metallic standard that it's all supposed to be based on is now in doubt because as soon as sovereign immunity attaches to the promises, then the gra there's a grave risk that they'll be dishonored and uh, eventually they will be and that'll be that. Um, so going back uh, to the question, you know, how do you uh, fix things? That's a very difficult question. Uh, uh, and now there are really two different questions. What should we do to fix our present monetary system and what would we have to do to get a metallic monetary standard back in place? They're not, as I said, hinted at before, the answers to those questions are, are not necessarily the same. Uh, indeed, I personally don't think going back to a metallic standard is 
uh, uh, worth even worth trying. I have to be very careful because I, I don't want to uh, <laughs> overstate the case. I certainly don't want to uh, uh, dismiss uh, contrary arguments by reasonable gold, gold standard fans, and there are plenty of them. Uh, but uh, here's what I see as the problem. In order to effect a change to the gold standard, first of all, it isn't enough to do, as some people have suggested, to merely make it legal for people to own gold and open bank accounts based on gold. Uh, some of those, to some extent, these things are legal, first of all, but even if there were no barriers to the use, again, of gold as a, as a monetary medium to no barriers to private coinage, to having banks that have gold deposits, and so on. The problem with the spontaneous development of a, a new gold standard is the same problem faced by any potential uh, uh, rival to an established monetary standard. It has to, it has to compete with a well-established standard and it confronts massive uh, network disadvantages or disadvantages of network economics in doing so. What, that's a fancy way of saying uh, the, a monetary standard is as useful as the size of the network of people already using it. It's rather like a, uh, being on a telephone system or computer uh, network in that respect. So this is like what, say, Bitcoin is well, it was yeah, dealing with. Yeah, it was like if only two dealing, people use it, but dealing. now more and more people use it. Well, yeah, and I'll talk about that in a second. I was going to allude to Bitcoin because it's a good case in point. In any event, if you've already got a, a standard today in the U.S., we have the fiat dollar administered by the Fed that's accepted pretty much by everyone, not only by everybody in, in the U.S. economy, but by large numbers of people elsewhere. That's a tremendously large network and a very hard one to compete with. And even though, even if it were true that a gold standard once established in place of the fiat standard would be better in some respects, it doesn't follow that it's better right away to any individual consumer because its small network size alone makes it inferior, right? So. That's why uh, I'm, I'm very doubtful that any degree of liberalization of, of laws to provide for choice and currency <clears throat> would itself suffice to cause a parallel gold standard to take off and, in, and eventually to replace what we've got. So that's that thing aside. Can I keep going? Do yeah. we still have time? I have a keep going question. Now. Okay. So um, then what's the alternative? The only alternative is that there should be an official attempt to reinstate the gold standard. All right. Well, what does that mean? The only sense I can make out of such an official attempt is that the, there would be uh, uh, legislation that would tell the Fed to once again make its dollars redeemable into, clo uh, into gold. And then, equip it with the necessary gold reserves, which the Treasury could easily do if the gold is in Fort Knox that it claims is there, for example, pick the right rate of conversion and so on. Now though, there are two problems or two possible problems. There is a rate of conversion such that you could make every unit of money in the economy 100 percent backed by gold or every Federal Reserve dollar on the Fed's books 100% backed by gold. But that would uh, almost certainly entail <laughs> a very dramatic uh, change in prices and deflation. It just to look at it this way, right? If we take the present price of gold and figure out um, uh, uh, and compare that to what amount of gold we would have to make the Federal Reserve dollars worth if they were each to be fully covered. Like one, so it's about $1,000 an ounce, an ounce yeah, right? So right. a dollar would but be take, one one yeah. thousandth of an ounce. You'd have to take the amount of gold that, that the Treasury uh, could provide to the Fed and the amount of dollars that uh, of Fed liabilities that presently exist and imagine what the price of gold would then be. One way or the other, you're going to have a very disruptive change if you do that. Now, if you allow for fractional backing of gold, 
then, of course, the, you could do it without that disruption. But then you'd have this other problem. Like the Scottish did, you're saying. Like that. Oh, yeah, some yeah. fraction. But then you'd have another problem because it's the Fed and the Fed no longer – has credibility. No one would trust the Fed. If you told me that as of tomorrow, the federal, my Federal Reserve notes in my wallet, I could go to the Fed and get a certain amount of gold for them, I'd go and I'd get the gold because I know there's absolutely no chance that the Fed's going to revalue its notes so that they, <laughs> they end up being worth more than the gold and then I regret what I did. But I know for sure that there is a positive value. I don't know what it is that the Fed's going to do what's, what it's done in the past and it's going to devalue or suspend and turn back to fiat money. Moreover, I know other people are thinking this. So they're going to go <laughs> and even if the Fed wasn't planning anything, between us, we're going to force it to devalue. We're going to, in other words, we're going to stage – what's called a speculative attack. That's what brought down the Thai baht and the ruble and the British pound and a million other, other fixed exchange rates in the past, not to even go back to previous gold standard devaluations. So, so spontaneous order won't do it. 100 percent reserves, forget about it. Uh, official fractional reserve-based uh, uh, gold dollar won't last. As far as letting alternative systems so we're not – we don't talk the government. The government doesn't formally switch to a gold standard or any other currency whether you know, the, the government of Greece adopts the Bitcoin or whatever. Um, but we – you know, it kind of emerges and develops in parallel. Is there a point at which it can't become the, the kind of default system that everyone's using because – of income taxes, like the government has to at some point, we have to pay taxes to the government. So if the government decided it's only going to accept dollars, it's never going to accept bitcoins, it's never going to accept gold or whatever these alternatives are, then we're kind of locked into using those. Yeah, that you remind me that I meant to, to, to say something about bitcoin as an example. It, bitcoin is fascinating because it's taken, it does have a foothold in the world of currency, but let's face it, it's tiny compared to the dollar network. Moreover. Right as we speak, other blockchain type uh, cryptocurrencies that have uh, uh, noted <laughs> the advantage of the established network money are competing effectively with Bitcoin for payments, remitment, remittments and, and other things that Bitcoin does very efficiently uh, and doing it successfully by, by being dollar based. But on, so on Aaron's question though, like if – Let's say something happens where Bitcoin. Let's talk about. I mean, for example, Venezuela right now is experiencing a hyper hyperinflation, and it seems that something like Bitcoin, if they they could be using that uh, in their you know to get around the currency, but when they have to pay taxes, they might yeah, have to use yeah. the Venezuelan. Mm -hmm. Or if there's, the question, or if there's yeah. employer tax withholding, yeah, that my employer it. has yeah. to pay me. Yeah. Well, the is answer, that is that why it would I never be no. able to take over? First of all. Um, it's true that when you have a, a crack up hyperinflation like Venezuela's, that of course is the one exception to the rule that the established network money is, 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 is preferred to, to others because the depreciation rate is so bad that the demand for – that the network is no longer attractive, right? That happens. It's very rare. And by the way, some gold standard fans seem to be looking forward to a hyperinflation in the United States so that that can happen here. That's another solution to getting to gold that I rather uh, would, avoid, would yeah. rather avoid. <laughs> and I don't like it, not because it might not work but because I just wouldn't want anyone to have to go through it. Um, and I certainly don't think it's something we should wish, wish for. Uh, but um, but uh, the, the, as for the tax argument, people – I think people have uh, – uh, many people, including economists, vastly exaggerate the role that uh, receivability of a money in taxes plays in driving the general uh, uh, acceptability of that uh, uh, money. It's true, of course, that, that governments are big players in their economies and to that extent – they are big contributors to the network effects. So yes, if a government accepts its, uh, an, its official money or an official money in payment of taxes, it's going to give a big advantage to that compared to other monies. But, but uh, although governments are big, there are other big players. And so tax receivability alone is not 
by any means usually sufficient to guarantee that the money that's so receivable will, will outcompete others. Remember that uh, if enough people prefer other monies, they can always, they can always uh, treat uh, the official money as something they buy just for the purpose of paying taxes. Let me make an analogy. Suppose occasionally you like to buy some goods from France. All right, what do you do? Well, when you have to do that, you go and you get a money changer to give you some francs and you buy the goods from France. The same thing could be done, let's say, of an economy where the government's got some crappy money and it says you, on, you can only use this to pay your taxes and everybody else prefers to use Bitcoin. Well, most of their purchasing and stuff they're doing with Bitcoin, but every once in a while they go and buy some, you know, um, <laughs> Zimb Venezuelan uh, uh, stuff just, just to pay taxes with and that's its only use. And they just do these spot exchanges, right? It's not going to do much for the value of the stuff. It's just going to, you know, they're going to be in and out of it. And that's that. So people should not uh, or exaggerate the extent to which governments merely by using the power of determining who can, what can be used to pay taxes, that they can prop up their monies to any considerable extent that way. It's a, it's in my opinion, that's a fallacy, though it's one that's, that economists, too many of them cling to. So we've discussed the problem, the gold standard, and the problems with putting it back into place, and then we have this concern of, as you brought up, of inflation and currency collapse, and a lot of a lot of people who talk a lot about monetary policy, especially the ones who corner you in bars and stuff like this, uh, talk about you know you know you better get your money into gold because in two years the dollar is gonna gonna absolutely collapse and, yeah, they, and it, they do kind of seem to wish it's gonna yeah, happen. That's the thing is sometimes yeah. there's a thin line between uh, saying that that's inevitable and wishing it would yeah, happen. But, but how how scared are you of this? I mean, we, you know, is this something that, that you think is a possibility if we keep going the way that we're going in terms of the way we print money and the way that we have a Fed? Is this something that you're like, yes? I mean, do you have gold buried in your backyard, George? Come on. That's what I want to know and I want to know where it is. If I do, <laughs> uh, actually, I, I don't because I don't have a backyard. Well, I have a backyard back in Athens. If I have gold there, I don't know about it. <laughs> it's possible. You know, I could be the next Sutter. Mine could – property could be the next Sutter's mill for all I know. But no, I didn't put any gold there. Um, well, look, <clears throat> the answer to that question would depend would vary uh, uh, depending on what country the person you're talk asking it lives in. Here in the United States, do I think uh, that we're in for hyperinflation anytime soon? I don't. I don't. Uh, fortunately, uh, our institutions are such that um, the dis public's dislike of of, of inflation. Uh, does in fact translate into uh, the the Fed and the government between them to consider them as a unit uh, um, are not um, not prepared to put up with the backlash they would get if they were to allow a lot of it, at least not under present circumstances. But what do, so that what do you see happening in the in, in the short and maybe we could stay at a short run in the long run we're all dead but in the short run with the system we have what is the even if we don't have the you know we're going to say we should have the gold standard what is the biggest danger that looms? In fact, I I just just wrote an op-ed about it, uh, what I consider to be the biggest danger this morning, uh, and uh, uh, it's um it. It is, it is indeed a danger of excessive Fed monetization of government debt and deficits. But uh, the reason it's a danger and a bigger one than we've had in the past is precisely because it, this time around, it's possible the Fed could do these things and not generate the inflation that would, would in turn cause a backlash. And, and its capacity to do that, its new capacity, is a result of its ability to pay interest on bank reserves, which is a power it gained in the course of the last crisis and has been using ever since. And so far, it uh, uh, has used that power uh, as a device that allowed it uh, 
to buy or add $3.7 trillion to its balance sheet uh, without causing inflation. I don't want to give the wrong impression. It had a lot of help from the fact that it was, after all, dealing with a depressed economy and exceptional liquidity demands. But in principle, paying interest on reserves is also a device for containing uh, uh, or rather uh, uh, for containing inflation by, by simply encouraging banks to pile up reserves instead of lending them. What I'm worried about is that in the future, a Fed uh, pressured to monetize the government's debt and we are after all uh, 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 looking forward to a Trump administration that could cause that debt uh, uh, to go <laughs> way up by trillions of dollars in a decade. Uh, 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 the Fed, now uh, that it's armed with this new tool, might be more inclined to cave in to the pressure from the administration to monetize debt, knowing that it has this tool by which it can prevent that monetization from resulting in inflation, essentially by uh, uh, causing the banks to pile up reserves. So what, what, what it does when it does that is basically t uh, uh, shunts the public savings from um, bank lending to productive industry and other purposes to lending to the government. So it's grabbing the savings in the same – the government grabs the savings in the same way it would if they were outright inflationary finance. But ironically enough, uh, the fact that this is going on is, is actually less obvious to people <laughs> than it would be if there were inflation because in order to, for them to recognize what's happening, they'd have to be co cognizant of the accumulation of bank reserves, the decline in bank lending and the multiplier and all that and the role of interest reserves. That's a lot for people to digest. It took them a long enough time to figure out that inflation was related to deficit financing and to, to therefore object to it. Uh, it's, it certainly would take them a long time to figure out this new method of shunting scarce savings to the government uh, uh, in order to gobble up paper over its deficits, and I'm really worried about that. If you've enjoyed listening to Free Thought this past year, I encourage you to go check out Libertarianism.org's Facebook page, where you can vote on your favorite episodes of 2016. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org. <laughs>